Though my heart has been untrue, though I cursed even hated you, you still love me. Though consumed with selfishness, anger, lies, and bitterness, you still love me. I so deserve your rejection No, I don't deserve your affection But your love, your great love is unconditional Yes, your love, your great love is unconditional Though I've had no time for you Was filled with pride, ungrateful too You still love me Though I've turned my heart away Constantly have gone astray You still love me Oh, I so deserve your rejection No, I don't deserve your affection But your love, your great love is unconditional Oh, your love, your great love is unconditional Yes, your love is unconditional Yes, your love is unconditional All right, uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone. That song is uh, appropriate because of what we're going to be talking about this evening, which is uh, God's love, and in particular, we're going to be talking about uh, expressions of God's love here this evening in relation to Israel in Daniel chapter 9. We're going to be talking about the mercy of God and, and the forgiveness of God, which is uh, directly related uh, to his at, the function of his, the attribute of his love, God's love. So 
Our subject this evening will be Daniel 9.9, where Daniel tells us that God is merciful and forgiving with Israel, even though they rebelled against him. So if you heard the lyrics to that song, uh, this is a, a, basically that song is a, a good description of what we'll be talking about here this evening in, uh, with God's relationship with Israel in the Old Testament. So uh, as we, we're going to have our prayer meeting at the end of class, and uh, as we normally do on Thursdays, our corporate prayer meeting, everyone is invited. Uh, and uh, also, uh, before we get underway, we take that moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves uh, to uh, examine ourselves, to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. When we confess our sins, we're restored to fellowship with God, and the filling of the Spirit is resto- restored simultaneously, because you can't uh, be filled with the sp- uh, in fellowship with God unless you're filled with the Spirit. And also, uh, the filling of the Spirit means you're influenced by the Holy Spirit, which implies that you're obeying Him. When he speaks to us through the teaching of the word of God. So if he's inspired 1 John 1, 1.9, which he has, like the rest of the scripture, if you do what it says, you're being influenced by the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is a very important time now because we want to worship God and we need to worship him in spirit and truth. As Jesus taught the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. And uh, so this, involve, uh, this demands that we confess our sin and, and to uh, be restored to fellowship and maintain that fellowship and the filling of the Spirit by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit tells us. And, uh, of course, he speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God, as I've mentioned many, many times before. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another day to study your word, to learn of your plan for our lives, to learn about your character and nature and the character and nature of your Son and the Spirit. We thank you so much for all the blessings that we have, not only in the temporal realm, but more importantly in the spiritual realm, and the fact that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of our union and identification with your Son, Jesus Christ. We have the victory through, both your, uh, through your son's death and resurrection, our identification with him in his death and resurrection and session at your right hand. So help us to appropriate by faith that position in Christ by, by obeying the commands of the New Testament to consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God. And uh, we just pray, Father, that we would see know, know you experientially, that we would personally encounter you and your son and the Holy Spirit through fellowship, and which is accomplished by obeying the Spirit's voice who speaks to us to the, your word. Father, we thank you for the completed canon of the scripture and placing us in this portion of the church age, this dispensation. And we just thank you for placing us in America and the, here in the 21st century and all the wonderful things that we have in this country and the freedoms that we have. And more importantly, uh, all the great uh, uh, teaching of the Word of God that we have in this country and all the different English translations that we have and other people in the church age have never had. Uh, we're totally blessed, and we thank you for the computer programs, the technology that we have, to, which enhances our Bible study, and we thank you for the, the, the men who have come before us, the, the, those who are expositors of the Scripture and we stand on the, these giant shoulders. We thank you for the men that you've raised up through the, throughout the church's history. Uh, the uh, Calvin, the Luthers, and the Carsons, and the Themes, and the Schaefers, and the Pentecosts, and Swindolls. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for uh, all these men throughout our history, uh, the history of the church, that have uh, helped us understand your word that you've worked mightily and powerfully through. Uh, Father, we just... Uh, Thank you for everyone that is assembled here this evening, not only here in Iowa, uh, but also those who might be viewing and listening to this class through internet radio, uh, Pal Talk, or the website. We thank you for each and every one of them. We thank you for Titus and Jody and their great hospitality and opening up their home to us so that we can teach here uh, four times a week. And we just thank you for their sacrifice and uh, their love for the body of Christ and love for your word. 
Uh, we just thank you for Titus's work with the sound and the recordings and the technology that we have. And we pray that you give him wisdom in those areas. We thank you for his service and this technology that we have that we can reach around the world. This is amazing that we, with a mouse click, uh, we can be in Tasmania and on the side of the world. And uh, Father, we just pray that you would help myself as the communicator to bring forth your full counsel with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power. We just pray that you would help me to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction, that the Spirit would use me as his instrument to communicate truth to your people. We pray that your people would have a humble heart, that they would receive the word firmly implanted, that they would be objective and be active listeners rather than passive listeners, and so that they might have an experiential knowledge of the truth. So, Father, we pray for this uh, class that it also would bring glory and honor to you and your son, Jesus Christ, and it would be a, a, a great expression of our worship for you, uh, of you this, in your son, Jesus Christ, here this evening in this Bible class. So, Father, we pray for these people and things. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, is where you should all be. Um, you, can have your, you should have your Bibles open to this uh, uh, chapter at verse 1, and also have my translation uh, in front of you as well. I'll be sending an updated uh, version of, uh, Dan of the translation of Daniel chapter 9 up to verse 22 is where I am right now in my studies of Daniel chapter 9. So uh, I'll be sending that out probably tomorrow to, to everyone. So uh, it says in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1, and I'm reading again from my translation. During Darius's first year, Ahasuerus' son, who was from Median descent, who was made king over the Chaldeans' kingdom, during the first year of his reign, I myself, Daniel, understood by means of the scrolls the specific number of years which the word of the Lord communicated to Jeremiah the prophet for completing devastating Jerusalem 70 years. Remember, Darius is the same individual we see uh, in Daniel chapter 5 and 6. He was... Uh, uh, he assumed power over the Babylonian kingdom because he was assigned, uh, he was, uh, it was bestowed upon him by Cyrus the Persian, the Babylonian kingdom, which is denoted by the phrase Chaldean's kingdom. Uh, remember, Darius was a subordinate to Cyrus the Persian, the Medo Persian Empire, as we saw in Daniel chapter 5, uh, destroy, uh, uh, basically uh, defeated Babylon, took over the city without firing a shot. And uh, they uh, absorbed the Babylonian kingdom into their empire, which was according to the prophecies that Daniel received uh, from God. So we have here, this is the situation. It's approximately 538, 539 B.C. Uh, when Daniel receives this vision uh, and may, uh, issues, uh, you know, uh, offers up this prayer to God for the Jewish exiles in Babylon. So uh, he's approximately, if, if, that's, the, if that's the case, uh, that means he's approximately in his mid-80s at this particular time, mid to eight, late 80s. Remember, because in 605 B.C., he was a teenager. He was probably 17 or 18 when he was deported to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion of Jerusalem. So uh, we see if you, you do 605 minus 538 B.C., you can do the math and add on the 17, 16 years of Daniel's age. It's approximately, Daniel's approximately in his late 80s uh, uh, at, that, at this particular time. Uh, he's also, it says, reading from Jeremiah. We know that uh, through a perusal of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, he's referring specifically to Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, as well as Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. So this is prompting him to pray. And remember, the prophecy in Jeremiah that he's reading pertains to the fact that uh, God was disciplining uh, the Judean kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Judah, uh, and he uh, was disciplining them for not observing the Sabbath rest for the land for se for seven, uh, on 70 different occasions. He, uh, every seventh year, they were supposed to give the Sabbath rest, uh, the land a Sabbath rest, rest the land, but they didn't do that 70 different times. So that's the reason why they were deported for seven years. Now remember, they were in the promised land a lot longer than that. So about half the time they were there, they failed to observe these Sabbath rests for the land. Uh, so that's what we have going on here at this particular point in the chapter. Now, uh, it says in verse 3, therefore, and the therefore is telling us that based upon this prophecy from Jeremiah, Daniel says, I devoted my full attention to my Lord, the one and only God, by repeatedly presenting prayer requests in the form of pleas for mercy while fasting with sackcloth as well as ashes. Indeed, I caused myself to enter into prayer to the Lord my God. Specifically, I caused myself to enter into confession. 
and said, O oh my Lord, the one and only God, the great one, yes, the awesome one, who is faithful to his covenant because of his unconditional love on behalf of those who love him, namely on behalf of those who conscientiously observe his commands, we, and he's speaking of, him, of Israel, have sinned, thus we have done wrong so that we've been condemned as guilty because we have rebelled. Specifically, we have deviated from your commands, that is, from your laws. Furthermore, to our own detriment, we never paid attention to your servants, the prophets, who spoke by your authority to and for the benefit of our kings as well as our leaders, and in addition, our ancestors, yes, to and for the benefit of all the people belonging to the land. So we see here that Daniel's prayer is an intercessory prayer on behalf of the Jewish exiles. He's not guilty of, of this, uh, this failure to uh, uh, be faithful to God. Uh, the, the nation of Israel is actually at fault here. Uh, Daniel is interceding for them. Uh, he is identifying with his people when he says we, though he's not involved in the unfaithfulness uh, uh, to the covenant with God. So he's not, unfa he's not to unfaithful. Israel is unfaithful. And I, and I have to clarify something here. When I say Israel here, uh, at this point I'm talking about Israel in relation, I'm, I'm talking about Israel, both the northern and southern kingdom. Remember that, that there's a northern and southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was uh, uh, deported by Nebuchadnezzar. The northern kingdom, which contained 10 of the tribes of Israel, uh, was deported uh, in, in this, the Assyrian invasion in 721 BC. And so uh, we saw that the southern kingdom was composed of Judea and Benjamin, those two tribes. And the other tribes were all dispersed from the Assy Assyrian invasion. So uh, at, at this point, you could, if I call uh, Israel, the southern kingdom Israel or Judah, you know what I'm saying. I'm speaking of the same southern kingdom when I do that. So th this is the, those, are the, those are the two tribes that went out on the, the uh, Babylonian invasion in 605, 597, and 586 BC. So notice it's an it's a intercessory prayer. It's expressing the love of God here in the life of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is motivated to pray because of the prophecy that was given to him. So uh, that's a good lesson for us to learn. We should learn the word of God and prophecy. It should, when we do that, it should motivate us to, uh, to love, our, to pray, and, and whether it's intercessory prayer for the unsaved or our own fellow believers. It's also notice Daniel's prayer involves confession. He's confessing the sins of his people here. And that's very important because uh, we see that Daniel, when we look at verse 20, Daniel mentions the fact, and he doesn't mention this earlier in the chapter, that he confessed the sin, and then he confessed the sins of his people. That's important because God wouldn't listen to his intercessory prayer and prayer of confession for Israel if he was out of fellowship with himself. Thus he confessed, mentions in verse 20 that he confessed his sin first, and then he was confessing the sins of his people. So he's identifying with the Jewish people, his Jew the, the Jewish exiles in Babylon. He's identifying with them, and notice he's, not only this is a prayer of confession, but notice something else about the prayer. Daniel knows a lot about the character and nature of God. He mentions that God is faithful, and that's based upon the fact that God is love. And his love is unconditional. Uh, so we see this is very important that we learn about the character and nature of God when we enter into prayer. We should uh, uh, learn, the learn about the character and nature of God. It will help us in to have a more productive prayer life. So we have here in verse 7 now, Daniel says, You were righteous, my God, my Lord, but we are publicly disgraced, as is the case this very day, we being the Jewish exiles in Babylon. To the detriment of the Judean people, as well as the detriment of Jerusalem's inhabitants, likewise to the detriment of all Israel, those nearby as well as those far away, in all the countries where you have driven them, because of their unfaithfulness, which they perpetrated against you. Now, again, in this passage, I noted it last evening, verse 7, Israel's referring to the northern kingdom. The, uh, the, the Ju uh, Judean people is referring to the southern kingdom. Uh, we see this, as I mentioned before last evening and the night before, in 1st, 2nd, and Kings, in 1st and 2nd Chronicles. We had to talk about the kings. He's a good king, a bad king. Well, you notice there's kings of Israel and there's the kings of Judah in those chapters and those books. And that's because there's a southern kingdom and there's a, north, uh, there's a northern kingdom. And that's why the kings are called Ju kings of Israel or the king of Judah. So that's important to keep in mind when we look at this passage here. Now look at verse 8. 
Daniel goes on to say and confess to God, we are publicly disgraced by being deported to Babylon. They're publicly disgraced by being defeated on the battlefield, by having their capital city and their center of worshiping their God being destroyed. They're publicly disgraced, Lord, he says, to the detriment of our kings, to the detriment of our leaders, as well as to the detriment of our ancestors, because we have sinned against you. Every aspect of Jewish society, uh, every, the, even the aristocracy, uh, is, is to blame. In fact, even the ancestors, the forefathers, previous generations in Israel, previous to the deport, the generation that was deported to Babylon, previous generations were, uh, and the majority were unfaithful. Yes, there was a small remnant that was faithful, but the majority in Israel throughout our history has always had the majority being unfaithful. And of course, that's going to switch when we, uh, uh, we're going to see that uh, when we get to the second advent of Christ, the majority are going to turn to Jesus Christ and be saved, whereas the majority of Jews today reject Jesus Christ. Uh, we see throughout Israel's history, uh, th they might have believed in, for, to be justified in the Lord, but after conversion, they were unfaithful. And this is true in the church today. There are a lot of Christians that are the, the people who are born again and saved, and you can't distinguish them from the, the uh, unsaved because they, don't have, they lack godly character, and they lack, lack godly character because they're unfaithful to God, meaning that they don't learn and obey the word of God on a habitual basis. Instead, they reject the word of God if they hear it or they don't even listen to it habitually. So that's, that tells you we have, a, we have a lot of unfaithfulness going on in the church today. It's no different than it was in Old Testament Israel. And uh, look at verse 9 at this point. And I'm reading from... I'm reading from the New American Standard at this point, and we got something, a little breath of fresh air here uh, from this inter in this intercessory prayer because now we're, we, we, there's hope here. Uh, it's now in verse 9. It's, Daniel says, To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. Whew. Thank God God is a God of compassion and forgiveness because there'd be no hope for the church or no hope for any person in the human race. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. This is a, a I think this is a, 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 a incorrect translation, and I'll show you in a minute. In fact, if you look at the verse, it, it doesn't make sense if you look at it. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. And then when he says, for we have rebelled against him, the New American Standard makes it sound like that's a, 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 presenting the reason why God is compassionate and forgiveness and forgiving. He's not passionate and forgiving because we rebel against God. That's what the New American Standard is making it sound like, doesn't it? I, I don't know what the, uh, let me, the, uh, the, uh, the Net Bible, and I got my Net Bible here for, for once. Uh, the Net Bible, uh, let me give you my, uh, the Net Bible says, yet the Lord our God is compassionate and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. That makes sense. That's good. Just look at, the, look at it again. He says, to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. Then when he says, for we have rebelled against him, the for there is saying, this is a causal clause. We have rebelled against him. So that would mean that the New American Standard is saying that the, the, uh, the, the God, is, God is compassionate and forgiving because we've rebelled against him? That doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense if we change the for to even though, doesn't it? So that's why the New American, uh, the Net Bible is nailed it right on the head there. In fact, I'll tell you right now, if I was going to get a Bible, and I might just switch over to it someday because we don't really have a big, uh, you know, church here, right? We wouldn't make a big deal. But uh, I wouldn't, I, you know, I might very well switch over to the Net Bible. And I'll tell you why. This, it's good for pastors and it's a good for lay people because the notes, and first of all, the translation's excellent. But the notes are very good because it gives you a little insight into going into what takes to translate. And it also gives you a little insight in some of these books as to interpretive problems. That's really good. That's really good. It gives you education. The, the Bible not only educate this Bible not only uh, gives you a good translation and that's uh, faithful to the original, but uh, it, it also gives you insight and, uh, and educates you as to uh, the different interpretive problems uh, that are found in the text, the original text. So, it's, and the Net Bible says in verse 9, Yet the Lord our God is compassionate and forgiving, even though we've rebelled against him. Even though is better than for we have rebelled against him. All right? What it means is th th what the, new, the Net Bible is interpreting, and, and I, interpret, I agree with them, is this, is that even though 
We've rebelled against God. He's, been, he's compassionate and forgiving. Makes perfect sense, right? It, of course it does. Now, when it says, to the Lord, our God belong compassion and forgiveness. To the Lord is expressing the so- God's sovereign authority over Israel and all of creation, as well as the personal covenant relationship between Daniel and the God of Israel. And also expresses the fact that compassion and forgiveness belong to the God of Israel. Or in other words, Daniel is saying that as to his character and nature, God is compassionate and forgiving. And we'll show you why he's compassionate and forgiving. Uh, It's related to his attribute of love. That's why he's compassionate and forgiving. Now when it says our God, that indicates that Daniel is appealing to the Lord to sovereignly intervene and restore to the land of Israel in Jerusalem the exiled Jews in Babylon and around the world at that time. And now the word that we have uh, for uh, that's translated compassion here is the word rakam, which is actually in the plural. It's in the plural form, so it, uh, it, it actually literally means acts of mercy or merciful acts because it's in the plural. Or you could say it's very close. The idea is more close to mercy than compassion, though mercy and compassion are, are related to each other. So therefore, Daniel is literally saying that acts of mercy belong to God, or you could say acts of compassion, but idiomatically, what Daniel is saying is that as to his nature... God is merciful, or in other words, God is compassionate. So this word describes God as compassionate towards sinners in the sense that he's merciful to them. He pardons them by withholding judgment, which is illustrated with eternal salvation. When God the Father doesn't judge the sinner when they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. With regards to Israel, God's, God withholds judgment in the sense that he does not completely wipe out the nation of Israel because he loves the nation. He withholds judgment toward Israel when they repent by confessing their sins and obeying him. In fact, God, with relation to the church, it's true of the church. When, in relation to the church, believers in the church age, uh, when we confess our sins and obey God, God doesn't discipline us. He withholds disciplining us. All right? Now, the articular construction of this noun, rakam, it indicates that this compassion or mercy is unique to God because it's rooted in his divine essence. And in particular, as I noted before briefly, it's, attribu- it's uh, directly related or rooted in his attribute of love. Let me show you this. Go now to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Hold your place. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And I'm reading from the New American Standard. And you, speaking of the, of the Ephesian Christians, were dead in your trespasses and sins. Meaning spiritually dead. Talking about a real spiritual death. Meaning you have no ability to have a relationship with God or start one with God because you have no merit with God and you have no desire to know God because you're spiritually dead. God's life and you're dead. This is before our conversion. So he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, your lifestyle, according to the course of this world, Satan's cosmic system, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, the, no, the non-Christian. Among them, the unbelievers, the non-Christians, we too, all formerly before our conversion, lived in the lust of our flesh, the sin nature, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature... Children of wrath, even as the rest. We're object of God's holy wrath. In fact, God's wrath uh, resides, uh, uh, comes from his holiness. God is wrath because he's holy. He he has wrath against the uh, children of uh, the the children of the devil, unbelievers. And this is what we were before conversion. We were object of God's wrath. Then, verse 4, we get a little uh, breath of fresh air here. But God, being rich in mercy. Now look what he says. Because of his great love, he's merciful. 
with which he loved us, even when we were dead, not transgressions. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. But notice verse 4. Where is God? God's merciful and compassionate because he's love. God's attribute of love. And remember, God's love is superior to human love because it resides in his perfect nature. And also, he doesn't need an attractive object to, in order to love. He can love the unlovely. God sent his son to the cross while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Now look at Romans chapter 5. Back up a little bit. Go to Romans chapter 5. A book we studied in detail over 500 hours. Look at Romans 5, 6. Romans 5, 6. For while we, us Christians, were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, the unsaved, which we were at one time. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare him to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So notice there, the love of God, it doesn't need an attractive object. We were all unlovely to God. We were disgusting to God. We had no... Uh, we have no uh, there was nothing that was attractive to God whatsoever. Let me read my translation of these verses. For while we were as an eternal spiritual truth, truth still helpless, still at, the, at that particular appointed moment in history, Christ died as a substitute for the benefit of the ungodly. For it is unlikely anyone will die as a substitute for the benefit of a righteous person. In fact, possibly, someone might also have the courage to voluntarily die as a substitute for the benefit of the good person. But God, that's the Father, as an eternal spiritual truth and fact of history, proves his own divine love for the benefit of all of us by the fact that while we were as an eternal spiritual truth, still sinners, Christ died as a substitute for the benefit of all of us. So God doesn't need an attractive object, and that's how he can love us, and that's how he can love the human race, and that's how he can do things for Israel as well in the past. It's because of this love. He's forgiving and merciful. He withholds judgment. He's compassionate towards Israel in the Old Testament and has not wiped her off the face of the earth for all of her unfaithfulness because of his attribute of love. He's unconditional love. And I'll tell you another reason why Israel's not destroyed. It's because of the promises that were given, the unconditional promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jeremiah, and David were those covenants, the Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, and New Covenant. Those covenants are based upon, are unconditional covenants based upon God's attribute of love. So God will never just wipe out the face, uh, Israel off the face of the earth. You'll, uh, Israel will always re uh, remain because of God's unconditional love for Israel, and is, uh, which is based upon, uh, which uh, results in these unconditional, pro uh, the unconditional promises that he made to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Jeremiah, which are all based upon his attribute of love. And so this is something we need to keep in mind about God. This is the very same love God wants to have in our lives, and it's reproduced in our lives uh, by the Holy Spirit when we uh, if, uh, respond in faith to God's love for us. Our, God's, our love has got to be a reflection of God's love. So therefore, we can love this unlovely, people who hurt us and are obnoxious to us, because we know how God's treated us. Uh, look at this. Uh, look at Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Quickly, I don't want to get too uh, sidetracked here, but this is important. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 30. Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom, you were, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ is also forgiving you. So you get the strength and the power and the motivation to forgive others, the unlovely people who hurt you, by looking at how God has treated you. A self-righteous Christian cannot forgive others. A person who is, got, who is living in righteousness can forgive others because they know that God has forgiven them much.
Now, then it says in Ephesians 5.1, no chapter break in the original, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. The love that God has demonstrated toward us, we would have reflected toward each other. Just as Christ also loved you, see, and gave himself up for us as an offering, a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So go back now to Daniel chapter 9, verse 9. So in Daniel 9.9, 9, which you should have hold your, held your place, Daniel 9.9 uh, 9 says, To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. So the word compassion there, rakam, it's a word that's in the plural, and it actually could be translated acts of compassion, or I like acts of mercy, because the word describes God as compassionate in the sense, uh, in the sense that he pardons sinners by withholding judgment, and, and uh, as I said before, uh, there's many different manifestations of God's uh, mercy and compassion uh, throughout history. So as we saw in Ephesians 2, 1-7, through this passage teaches us that God's attribute of love causes him to be merciful, meaning that God is compassionate towards his enemies and pardons them when they w believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. There are many examples in the scriptures of divine mercy being expressed towards different individuals and nations throughout history. For instance, Ezra and the Jews returning from the Babylonian captivity were also beneficiaries of the Lord's mercy. Uh, uh, what are we reading about in Daniel 9.9? 9? Who's Daniel praying for? The Jewish exiles in Babylon. Nehemiah and Ezra re record the return in the re of the Jews from e exile in Babylon to the land of Israel and rebuilding the temple, rebuilding Jerusalem. All right? So... Uh, by the fact that those two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, basically record uh, in history God's mercy and compassion, uh, his attribute of love being manifested towards the Jewish exiles in Babylon by allowing them to go back to the land of Israel and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. The Lord was time and time again uh, throughout Israel's history merciful to the rebellious Exodus generation as well. Uh, we saw that uh, in, uh, in, in the book of Exodus. Uh, God, God was merciful. In fact, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, he, remember he prompted Moses to intercede and prayer for the, the Exodus generation when they, when they erected the golden calf and they went into idolatry. Uh, God had no intention of wiping them off the face of the earth, though he said to Moses, uh, I will rebuild, uh, 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 let me add them. Basically, God said, let me add, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'm going to make a new nation from you, Moses. And obviously, if God wanted to do that, he wouldn't have asked Moses or told Moses, you just would have wiped them out. The fact that he didn't and, and said this to Moses was designed to motivate Moses to intercede in prayer for, for them. So uh, God's compassion, his mercy, has been and is and will be expressed towards every believer in every dispensation who executes the Lord's plan for their dispensation. Now, God's compassion will be expressed towards Israel in the future when they will be regathered through, from, from throughout the entire world and restored as a client nation to God during the millennium. Uh, that's uh, taught in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3. The Lord expressed his mercy towards Israel in the past by sending prophets to warn them of the impending fifth cycle of discipline if they didn't repent and adhere to his law. That's taught in 2 Corinthians uh, Second Chronicles 36.15. Could you hold your place in Daniel? Go to Second Chronicles 36.15. Yeah, first, second Kings after that. Go to Second Chronicles 36.15. Look at actually, look at 2 Chronicles 36, look at verse 11. Let's start there. So we could look at verse 15 in context. Second Chronicles 36, look at verse 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke for the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Furthermore, all the officials of the priests and the people were very unfaithful, just what Daniel mentioned in his prayer, following all the abominations of the nations, and they defiled the house of the Lord, which he had sanctified in Jerusalem. The Lord, the, the Lord, the, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again, by his messengers, 
Because why? He had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, the prophets, like Jeremiah, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no uh, remedy. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonians, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hands. And it goes on to talk about the articles of the temple being taken away as well. We saw that in Daniel 1. Uh, so what we have here is that oh, God showed his mercy and compassion for Israel. His desire to withhold judgment against Israel by sending the prophets over and over again. What were they sent for? To call the people to repentance. To call them to be faithful. But they refused and didn't listen to these prophets. And thus God said, okay, that's it. And finally he, he had to uh, uh, discipline them severely. Now, go back now to Daniel chapter 9 verse 9. It says in Daniel 9, 9, to the Lord our God belong compassion. And then he says, forgiveness. Uh, the word for forgiveness there in the Hebrew is the word salika. Salika is in the plural as well. Thus it means acts of forgiveness. Or we could say forgivenesses. But I like acts of forgiveness. And therefore what Daniel is literally saying is that acts of forgiveness belong to God. But idiomatically, what he's actually saying is that as to his nature, God is forgiving. God is forgiving because of his attribute of love, as we've seen. The articular construction of this noun, uh, salika, indicates that this forgiveness is unique to God because it's rooted in his divine essence, and in particular, it's rooted in his attribute of love, just like his mercy and compassion. The believer, if you uh, look at scripture, the scriptures teach that the Christian, the believer, and the believers from all dispensations both uh, the, uh, the past up to this point and then in the future, are both the object and the subject of forgiveness. Meaning, we're the object of God's forgiveness. We've re we're the beneficiaries of God's forgiveness uh, at salvation. We believed in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We received the forgiveness of our sins so that we would not go to eternal condemnation and that we could live with God forever. After conversion, we receive the confession, uh, forgiveness of sins through the confession of sin, and that allows us to have fellowship with God once again, because sin knocks us out of fellowship with God. And in, in, a, per, in a perfective sense, for all of eternity, perpetually, we'll experience the forgiveness of God throughout eternity. And uh, we see here that as a result of that, because we're the beneficiaries and the objects of God's forgiveness, we're sub we have to be the subjects as well as we just saw in Ephesians. We're, because God's forgiven us, we're to forgive others. And that's a shocking thing when you hear some Christians, and I've heard Christians say that, when somebody confronted them, why can't you forgive this person? And they say, I'm not, I can't. <laughs> you know, the, well, that's, uh, you're basically out of fellowship. <laughs> God's not going to forgive you if you can't forgive others. Uh, let me show you that. Let me show you. That's a very serious deal there. If you say you can't forgive others, uh, God won't forgive you. Look at uh, Matthew. Hold your place in Daniel. Look at Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 6. And when I say he won't forgive you, he's not going to have fellowship with you. He's not going to restore you to fellowship with uh, himself as a believer. That's what he's talking in the context of disciples and their lack of forgiveness. Look at it says in uh, Matthew 6. Look at verse 14. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now look what he says. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now he's talking about disciples who are already saved. So that means he's, when he says he's not going to forgive you, it means you're not going to restore you to fellowship with God if you uh, uh, do not stubbornly want to forgive others. So that's a serious thing, and it's shocking that a, any Christian could be unforgiving toward another Christian when he, they've been forgiven by God. Who do you think you are? Didn't it just read in Ephesians, and it's in Colossians as well, you're to forgive one another as God in Christ is forgiving you. You're obligated in fact, if you ever hear a Christian say that, you don't say this to an unbeliever, but say this to a, a believer if they ever pull this on you, you tell them and confront them and rebuke them in gentleness and say, 
God's forgiven you, you are obligated to forgive that person. You are obligated. You don't have a choice in the matter. In God's eyes, you, there's no other, you have to forgive them. And listen to me. You, uh, the person who's, who done, who's done wrong to you, we've done worse to God. Trust me. You. You've done worse to, worse to God than they, this person's ever done to you. Trust me. You, if you don't think so, you really don't understand how wicked of a sinner you are and how holy God is. Okay? So forgive. Because you're obligated to, and you're obligated to because God has forgiven you through Christ. Did he not? Right. So, very important that we see that the believer is not only the beneficiary of forgiveness, but he's also to dispense forgiveness as well. He's to exercise forgiveness towards his fellow Christians, and all men for that matter. At the moment of conversion, the Christian received the forgiveness of his sins in the positional sense. That's taught in Ephesians 1.7 and Colossians 1.14. After conversion, the believer is commanded to forgive, as we saw, because God has forgiven him. Ephesians 4.32, Colossians 3.13. The believer cannot experience the forgiveness of sins and be restored to fellowship if he doesn't forgive others, as we read in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Why? Because not forgiving others is a sin. After conversion, the Christian experiences the forgiveness of sins like he did at, the, at his conversion when he confesses any known sin to the Father. That's taught in 1 John 1, 9 and Psalm 32, 1 through 4. Now, based upon the merits of the unique voluntary, substitutionary, spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross, the Father is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and restores us to fellowship with himself because of what Christ did on the cross. And remember, the Christian's forgiveness of sins is based upon the promise of forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament. Remember, the Gentile believers are engrafted in to the to the uh, to, uh, to the, the the olive tree Israel. Remember Romans eleven, and because of that, we're the beneficiaries of the uh, the covenant promises to the Old Testament saints like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and 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 we're not the covenants weren't given to us, but they were we're benefiting from them because we're engrafted into Israel. Not that we're Israel, we're different entities, but we're engrafted into the promises. That's Romans eleven teaches that. And one of the promises in the new covenant was the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus, in fact, Jesus mentions that. He says in Matthew 26, 28, he says, for this, and when he does the Lord's Supper, he says, for this, uh, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. What covenant is he talking about? The new covenant. And Paul mentions that. This is the new covenant in, my, in 1 Corinthians 11. The new covenant in my blood. It's, uh, the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins, is based upon Christ's death on the cross, his blood. Okay, so what we have here is that uh, God, we have two attributes, that you can go back to Daniel 9.9, 9. what we have is Daniel's mentioning two attributes, of, uh, an attribute of God uh, indirectly, the love of God, and the exercise of God's love toward Israel uh, expresses itself in merciful acts, uh, withholding judgment, and also forgiveness for sins. So that's how God's, op uh, God's attribute of love function toward Israel in Daniel's day. Now, look at Daniel 9, 9, and we'll finish off the verse here. And this is where I mentioned earlier in the evening that the phrase, for we have rebelled against him, is, a, is an incorrect translation. It should, be say, it should say, even though we've rebelled against him, because it makes no sense to make it a causal clause here. So when he says, for we have rebelled against him, that's a, a, a concessive clause, uh, which is expressed by the words even though or although. And it's a concessive clause, meaning that God is merciful and forgiving even though or despite the fact that Israel rebelled against him. So write in your Bibles, if it's not there already, get cross out for we have rebelled. Right? Instead of F-O-R, cross it out and write even though or despite the fact that. Okay, because it's a concessive clause. He's saying that despite the fact, or even though Israel had rebelled against God, God was still merciful and compassionate. Daniel is appealing to God in this prayer for Israel, and he's appealing to, that God would once again be merciful to Israel, stop disciplining them, take them out of Babylon, which is actually, if you, and forgive them. And actually, that's what God wants, because didn't Daniel read Jeremiah? In Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12, and 29, 10 through 14, that after 70 years, God would bring Israel back to the land? 
and Jerusalem would be rebuilt in the temple. So we know it's God's will to forgive them and to be merciful. So Daniel is bringing out a great important aspect of prayer, an essential aspect. We have to pray according to the will of God. Too many times we look at God and think he's Santa Claus. We, we're to ask what he wants, not what we want. And trust me, we many times are not looking at God's things at God's perspective because we ask out or we beg out of certain situations that we don't like when in reality, it might be God's will that we do go through this adversity. Look at Jesus on the cross. Look at Paul going to Jerusalem. And, he was, and, and everybody was saying, oh, don't go there. But Paul said, I got to go. I know there's going to be chains and all kinds of stuff for me. I'm, he was following the example of Jesus who went to the cross even though he, what did it say in Hebrews? Despising the shame, disregarding the shame. He endured the cross because of the joy set before him, us. And Jesus said, you know, when he, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will, but yours will be, your will be done. What was that? If this cup can pass, the cup is the cross. And he knew what that meant. He would, he would be separated from his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was shrinking back from that, but he did God's will. And I shouldn't say he was shrinking back from that. He, he was, it, it would terrified him. As a human being, it terrified him. So listen to me. What it happens now is what happened, is, what we need to say here is that, uh, that Daniel was praying according to the will of God. That's what we should do. Okay, we need to be prayers about asking what God wants for what God wants, not what we want. See, what we want is always the easy way out and simple things in life and no, and, and no problems. We're all like that. I'm like that. Everybody's like that. It's only our nature. But, you know, you read God's word, you know, it's the part of the will of God that we suffer undeservedly too. And we, do we pray that God take us out of this situation? Or do we say, God, keep me in this situation so I can bring glory to you? Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Your power is manifested in my human weakness. So what we have here is that this is a concessive clause. It shouldn't be for we have rebelled against him. It should be even though or despite the fact that Israel rebelled against God, God forgave them and, was, and is merciful and, uh, and uh, compassionate. So let me give you my translation of verse 9. It says, my Lord, our God, is merciful as well as forgiving, even though we've rebelled against him. So he's telling, telling us something. God loves the unlovely. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Just what we read in all these other passages this evening in the New Testament. He, even though Israel is obnoxious to God, God and rebelled because they rebelled against him, God is still merciful and forgiving. It's talking about the unconditional love of God. God loves Israel unconditionally. So after listing the charges and the indictment against Israel in Daniel 9, 5 through 8, here in verse 9, Daniel says to God that he's merciful and forgiving even though Israel rebelled against him. God is merciful and forgiving with Israel because of his attribute of love, as we pointed out. Those in Israel who repent by confessing their sins will receive forgiveness of sins and mercy in the sense that God will withhold judgment and discipline in order to restore the repentant sinner to fellowship with himself. So Daniel knew this about God because Daniel was a student of the scriptures. That's why Daniel's prayer is so magnificent because it's saturated with the word of God. I've been pointing this out and I'll continue to point it out through the prayer. Daniel gives us a great example to follow. He knows his Old Testament. He knows his Bible because he's quote, he, he uses phrases and expressions that are all over the law, the Mosaic law, and even found in Solomon's uh, prayer for the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8. Uh, he's, he's alluding to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, which we read the other night. His prayer is steeped in that, those passages. It's, it's take, uh, his prayer is derived from those passages. So Daniel knew this all about God, that God uh, was a God of love and forgiveness and mercy because he was a student of the scriptures. He could see, he could see from the book of Exodus that as to his nature, God is forgiving and merciful. Remember the Exodus generation. We studied the book of Exodus, all 40 chapters. We studied Genesis, all 50 chapters. Over 300 hours, we did Exodus, 40 chapters. Okay? Now, we, what do we learn over there? And by the way, I have to throw this in. 
take a little perusal around America and check websites. See how many people have done Genesis and Exodus, both books. And it, I'm, not, I'm saying that it's, and I don't say this to brag, I'm saying how sad that not more, these books are not being taught. How sad. How sad. I'm, 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 I'm bemoaning the fact that that's the case. I shouldn't be one of the few that is, and I am one of the few that are, is doing that. It should be all of us teaching these books. All of us pastors. Instead of doing these topical studies about dating relationships and marriage and all the same garbage, the same hobby horses, and the angel of conflict for the 50 millionth time. Are you kidding me? How many books do we have in the Bible we can't teach any of these books? When's the last time you taught Romans? Show me out there. Give me somebody who's done the book of Romans from cover to cover. That's terrible. We can't, I, I, I'm hard-pressed to find anybody who does that book. You know why? Because pastors are giving in to the whole thing of tickling people's ears because they know they can't keep the crowds and the offerings up if they teach these books because they know the body of Christ, the majority, are a bunch of babies and a bunch of lazy-minded people who are in love with the world, the Satan's cosmic system. And that's the truth. That's the truth. So we see that Daniel... He knew his Bible. He knew the Old Testament. He could see from the Exodus generation under Moses. Uh, the Exodus gener generation rebelled against Moses. We studied that book, book of Exodus. They rebelled against Moses' authority and God's authority many times. Yet, God didn't completely destroy the nation, did he? No. Instead, in response to Moses' intercession, God forgave Israel and withheld judgment by not wiping out the nation completely. Go home tonight and read Exodus 32 through 34. And by the way, I would, I, would, I would go through every single one of those classes we did on the book of Exodus. You know, don't skip around the books, the things that, you know, people do that too. The internet people, you got to watch out. You should, if you're going to do, read, do Romans, go from one thing all the way through. If you're going to do First Timothy, study it all the way through. If you're going to do Genesis, start from the beginning and go all the way through. Don't skip around and pick out what you want to hear. That's not the that's not the way God wants you to do it. Think about it. God's writing the He has Paul write Romans, and you want to just check out, and I see a lot of pastors do this. They only they only study a certain passages in Romans or Genesis. But there's the whole book. I mean, what an insult to God the Holy Spirit and God the Father and the Son. If all those chapters are there and that He expects them to be read, God expects them to be read and, and no, understood. How can, we, how, can we, how can we skip around? Is that a sign of wanting our ears tickled? I don't know. It should, I hope not. But we should be, we should be looking and, and, and going right through each of these passages. See, it takes discipline to do that. It takes discipline to do that. And many of you, and I can think of, I got the Thompsons in front of me. I got the, the, the Fletchers, uh, George, Pixie, I mean, Pixie, can you think? Pixie can't even hear. And Pixie's there pretty much every night and all the adversity that's going on in her life. And uh, with, uh, Alice, Alice with her crazy dogs. Alice is pretty much there every night. Even though she a, gets a little crazy with Ron Paul a little bit, I love her still, but she's there pretty much every night. God, I love her. God, I love it. You people, have many of you have gone through all these books with me. And you should, be, you should be happy that you have done that. That's an accomplishment. It took discipline to do that. Hey, I know it's tough to sit there and listen to my stupid Massachusetts accent and my, look at my bald head every night. I know it's difficult. But you've got to persevere and overlook that and say, I want to listen to the content of this guy's mouth. I want to listen to what this me the Holy Spirit's saying to this guy and, and not get sidetracked with what he's wearing tonight. Don't look at him. You know? So we need, to, we need to see something here that, uh, that Daniel, he saw in the Old Testament that God is forgiving and compassionate and his unconditional love, exercises unconditional love toward Israel because he saw it in his Old Testament. He saw it in Exodus. The fact that God disciplined the nation of Israel by sending her into exile for 70 years in Babylon did not mean that God was withholding mercy and forgiveness from Israel. However, it did mean that because he is also righteous, God punished Israel's unrepentant sin and rebellion and disobedience. The fact that God did not wipe out completely the nation of Israel, but instead left a faithful remnant, is further evidence that God is merciful and forgiving. 
So Daniel is saying that God always treats Israel better than she deserves. God's love is magnanimous. God's love is magnanimous, meaning that God is generous in forgiving insults and injuries without being vindictive and becoming involved in petty resentfulness. Don't miss this. This is where we gotta, we gotta watch out for this. We can't be involved in vindictiveness or being petty, pettily re resentful toward other people. We gotta watch out. That's the flesh. God's love in our life will manifest itself and that we're generous in forgiving insults and injuries without being vindictive toward others or becoming involved in petty resentfulness. Pettiness is killing the church. God's not petty. Why are we? So magnanimity is related to forgiveness. If you read Colossians 3, 13 through 14, Daniel's asking God here and Daniel 9, 9 to be magnanimous with Israel. Israel doesn't have a leg to stand on in relation to God. So they must appeal to God's merciful and forgiving character and nature if they're to have any hope of a future because Israel has no excuses. They're responsible for the situation they're in in Babylon. Yet, because of his knowledge of God's character and nature, which he acquired through his Old Testament scriptures, such as the law, Daniel knew that there's always hope for Israel and, in fact, a confident expectation of a bright future for the nation because God is magnanimous and merciful and forgiving. And he's been that way to us. Thank you, God. Think about that. We've been forgiven much. God is so merciful, so gracious, so forgiving, unconditional love. Thank God he doesn't throw us into the lake of fire for sin. Thank God he forgave us all of our sins through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Thank God he restores us to fellowship and when we confess our sins after conversion. And thank God we're going to experience the forgiveness of sins throughout all of eternity. We'll live with him forever all because of that love. That love, that love he manifested at the cross of Calvary. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us, encourage us, instruct us in righteousness, reprove and rebuke us if necessary, so that we might continue to grow in our relationship with you and grow in Christ-like character. So Father, we pray that this class also would bring glory to you and your Son. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, give us a couple minutes. We're going to do our prayer meeting, corporate prayer meeting, and you're all invited. You too, Tyler.